Hi, Phil. Hi, how are you, Catherine? I'm doing great. How are you? Um, okay, just uh, um, trying to get through some writing this morning. I'm working on my second book already, so. Wow, um, good for you. A little, a little break to chat with you. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I am so excited about this. I think this is so important right now, and I um i think to have you on here is just incredible so um to introduce you to all of my viewers hi guys this is phil chan he is the co-founder of final bell for yellow face which is an amazing organization um, i'll let him tell you a little bit more about it in his words but um he and my former new york city valley co-worker georgina pascogan are working to eliminate the sort of offensive and outdated racial stereotypes about Asians on stage. And I think that is incredible. So thank you so much for joining us, Phil. I think uh, what you guys are doing is amazing. So. Thank you, glad to be here. And I wanna start by saying, you know, I am fully aware of my white privilege and the fact that I do not understand and will never fully understand. And I am one of those dancers who was raised to not even, as horrible as it sounds, we never really gave it a second thought, more so like, for example, using Nutcracker. Um, I'm one of those students that just thought, well, it's just a choreography for Chinese. You know, it's just, that's how it is. And so I am very honored to be talking to you. And I have in the past not really used my platform as I should have because for several reasons. One, I just didn't want to be offensive because I don't fully understand and I want to learn, but I just didn't want to offend anyone. But also I have thought, you know, you are white. It's not your place um, to talk about it. But I think now more than ever, it is my place through this platform to, to, to talk about this. So I am just thrilled to have you here. Um, so yeah. first, go ahead. Just point out, out a good thing, like yellow face in general, it's not really an Asian problem. It's sort of a white problem. Like it's not Asian people portraying themselves badly. It's white people portraying them in an ignorant way. So like when you say, oh, it's not my problem, it actually like, it is oh, your problem. Really? <laughs> I'm, you know, to, to preface, I'm also white. Uh, my dad is Chinese, my mom is white. So um, I do consider this my problem, but also my solution. So um, yeah, sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> No, no, no. I, and I think that's, again, why we're here. It is, and that me not wanting to speak up because I don't want to offend is the problem, you know, and us not, not doing anything about it. So first of all, tell people about your organization and what you guys do specifically. So um, Jean and I have been friends for a long time. Um, and I'm on uh, an advisory committee for the Asian American Arts Alliance that gives away a choreographic prize every year for an emerging Asian American choreographer in honor of Jadine Wong, who was a pioneer Asian dancer. Um, and so brought Gina on, on board with that. And so she was also starting to think more about her own Filipino heritage. And she was on a diversity committee at New York City Ballet at the time as well. So we're starting to, um, together in our friendship, talk about race a little bit more and talk about what it means to be Asian. Um, and as this was going on, within their diversity committee. Again, I wasn't in the room, so I can't speak to it, but they were talking about issues at New York City Ballet. And one of the things that came up um, was the Chinese Diversement uh, in Nutcracker. And Peter Martins, uh, who was the artistic director at the time was saying that um, the company had been receiving literally thousands of letters over the years from audience members of all races saying, hey, this portrayal is making me uncomfortable. Um, and I, I, I'm just growing, like, I don't really want to bring my kids to this anymore. Like, I wish you guys would address this. So, um, and, and for Peter Martins, he was sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place where he couldn't change Balanchine's work. You know, like it was his responsibility of all people to maintain the work of Balanchine's legacy. Um, but at the same time, he couldn't ignore this growing change of, of audience members, board members, um, ticket buyers, subscribers, being uncomfortable with how this work was being done. Um, so Gina was like, I'm not Chinese, but I'll give you Phil's number, who is Chinese, he knows the choreography, is a dancer. Um, and for where I'm coming from is, you know, I'm a dancer too, so I am Chinese, but I'm also a dancer. This is part of my heritage too. So I'm not interested in saying, well, like, let's burn the whole thing down. Because like, I do see, the value of what the artistic merit of what's happening on stage. So um, I like to, and I write about this in my book, um, I, I like to think of ballets as like bonsai trees, like they're sort of like this living art, right? Um, and 
like any sort of plant, they sort of grow a little bit unruly and you sort of have to trim them a little bit just to keep the general shape of what the bonsai tree is. But like it does require a little bit of pruning to keep it healthy. And I think ballets are, are sort of this, the same way, um, you know, to keep it fresh and relevant, especially these story ballets that might have a moral attached to them. Um, so in this meeting with Peter Martins, he talked about uh, three different aspects of the dance, the makeup, the choreography, and the costuming. And we looked at both the history of how Asians have been represented. So how is this part of a larger conversation, but also how have historically Asians been portrayed on stage? So this first side of how Asians have been represented, you look at everything from um, the Chinese Exclusion Act, you look at Japanese internment and concentration camps, and you look at the political media of what's happening at the time. So is it cartoons? What was, what, how are they being portrayed in media? How are we talking about Asian people in, in our politics? And you look at those images and you start to see those bleeding into ballet on stage. Um, so in Nutcracker and Balanchine's Nutcracker, for example, the Chinese man who pops out of a box it looks very much like the first Chinese people that came to America. They're wearing sort of mm -hmm. this rice backpack. They're working on the railroad, so they're keeping the sun off their, their head. They have this Q hairstyle, which is a symbol of oppression. So the Q hairstyle is actually when the Manchu people in the north conquered the Han people in, the, in southern China. They made all of the men have this hairstyle to show that they were subservient to the Manchu rule, essentially like a Jewish star. In a, in a Holocaust or a ghetto, you know, so basically identifying a group of people. And uh, if you cut your hair, if you have any different style hair, it was an act of rebellion and an act of treason. So you could literally lose your head if you had a different style. Um, and so early Chinese Americans who came over as laborers, they were often either lynched by their hair or they were, they were, their hair was cut off, essentially meaning that they could never go back to their home country, you know? Like just, you know, and so you see these things in Nutcracker and it's like, why are we still representing Chinese in this way? Like you could be a panda bear, you could be a Chinese prince, you could be, uh, you know, so many other things. Like why is it, why is it this like dirty image of Chinese people? And it's everywhere, you know, like it's always this like same tired thing. Um, and so that's one side of the conversation. And the other side is you have to see what are Asians saying about themselves in, um, in ballet stages? I mean, how many Asian choreographers have made work for a major ballet company that you can name? Probably- I can really only think of Ed Liang. Right, like, exactly. And yeah. So we have this vacuum where there aren't Asian voices telling their own stories and all Asian-ness is what Europeans thought Asians looked like either 50, 150 years ago. I mean, if you look at Bayadere, there's nothing Indian about Bayadair. It's what Western people thought Indian people looked like 150 years ago. That's true, yeah. And so for us to say, well, it's tradition, and we, we do this ballet again today, and we have a community of South Asian people, we're taking their tax dollars, public money, to do these ballets, and Indian dance companies get a fraction of what ballet companies do. So, and here we are doing Bayadair, you know, it sets up this dynamic that is really difficult as an Asian American artist to find your place um, on stage or as a choreographer or as a lighting designer, you know, whatever. Um, it basically says you're not, you're not centered here. It, whiteness is centered. And so, you know, whether it's Marie with all the countries dancing around her, whether it's Aurora with all of the other countries dancing around her, there's this idea that the white center is the only one that matters and everyone else is peripheral. Um, and so, yeah, in that context, when you, and then when you have Chinese tea, which is always like the dirty chink, it mm. sets up a, a dynamic where you look at, at New York City Ballet, for example, and you're like, wow, where are the Asian ballerinas? Right. Subconsciously, it sends a message to students saying, if I go to that school, I might, not, I might not get to dance Sugar Plum. I will never find a place other than this like bowing, shuffling thing. And like, is that really the kind of dancing I want to do? No, I want to dance theme. I want to dance, you know, foresight. I don't want to dance tea. <laughs> you know, I, and th I think you're so right because you, if we don't start doing this, you're actually alienate, alienating 90% of your audience, and then the art form dies because right. those young Asian dancers say, Well, there's no place for me, and then they get 
offended and then they don't want to go to the ballet ever again and they don't put their kids in ballet and I mean it's this sort of snowball but it's also not just Asian people it's also white people who say this is not this doesn't reflect my values and like I don't I don't want to indoctrinate my kids with like this idea that we have blackface and like that that's fine and no one questions that like because it's tradition and so I think and I talk about this in my book so so this last uh, couple months I've written a book um, called Final Bow for Yellow Face, uh, Dancing Between Intention and Impact, that talks about this dynamic in ballet, but also how to talk about race. And it's focused on the Asian experience because that's how I see the world, but also it applies to other racial groups and basically how we deal with race in general in the ballet world. So I do want to acknowledge that there's a lot that we need to be talking about in terms of the black experience in ballet. There is so much more that we need to unpack there. Um, my book is complementary to that conversation, but by no means a, a substitute. So we really need to listen to those black voices first. This is something that can complement your way of thinking about all races uh, in a slightly different way. And how do we think about ballet for everybody? So if you think about who was the audience in ballet, um, you know, in Imperial Russia, in Imperial France, you know, it was nobility. It was the, the aristocrats, the top elite, richest people who got to ballet, who got to participate in ballet, and their values were reflected in those dances. So you have Louis XIV as the sun god, and he's the center of the universe. You know, that's, that's what they're programming to people to, to see. And then, um, you know, then we have more common people are allowed to do ballet and suddenly women are allowed to dance, then men are allowed to dance and women aren't. And, you know, that kind of switches around for a while uh, about who's allowed to dance. But then ballet, this old world art form that was made for Europeans by Europeans that centers Europe as the center of the universe, that art form comes to America mm -hmm. where we suddenly have diversity. We didn't have diversity before in ballet, but we do now. We have Indian people in the audience for Bayadere. We have Chinese people in the audience watching Chinese tea and Nutcracker. And all of a sudden, this old world way of doing it where you have a Eurocentric lens, that doesn't work in diverse America. So That's what do we do? You know, so, like, so I think the responsibility of us as American artists is to figure out new ways of doing the old world way. So if you think about Shakespeare, I mean, how many productions of Shakespeare have you seen that are like set in other places? A million. Like, <laughs> and, and they work because it gives you like a new fresh context. So even though you're hearing words that were 400 years old, you're still laughing at the same jokes because it's still a fart joke or it's still a sex joke or it's still, you know, the same feeling of losing a loved one or having someone murdered in front of you that all of those feelings are sort of universal but you can set Romeo and Juliet or A Midsummer Night's Dream somewhere else to give it a fresh context. And for some reason, because ballet, I guess, doesn't have written text and it's like, you have to teach me, I have to teach my student, she will then teach her student. That's the way we pass it on, this oral tradition. I think we're less willing to take artistic risks and like try completely new settings. Um, we see a lot of originality in Nutcracker. Lots of people trying new versions of Nutcracker just because there's so many. So there isn't like that same responsibility of like, oh, if we do a different Nutcracker, we'll lose tradition. Whereas like Corsair, there's not many Corsairs out there. It's not as common. Yeah. And so it's like, well, we sort of have to do it this way because if we don't do it this way, there, there might not be a Corsair. Mm -hmm. And so I'm working on a version of there with Doug Fullington, who's a, 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 a Petit Pas scholar out of Pacific Northwest Ballet. And we're taking all of the Petit Pas steps, but we're setting our Corsair in Atlantis Beach. It's the Miss Ocean's beauty pageant. Oh, that's and amazing. <laughs> instead of odalisques, we have showgirls. Instead of slaves, we have beauty pageant contestants. And instead of pirates, we have, you know, mobsters. It's in a casino. It's a, and it's sort of like Ocean's Eleven. They're, they're trying to steal, you know, some jewels. And it's the same choreography. It's the, all the same petty pas variations, all the same steps. But we're framing it in a way that makes it about us instead of them. So it doesn't have to be in Arabia. It can be, it can be about a beauty pageant. It doesn't have to be about slavery, especially, oh my goodness, slavery. 
look at our own complicated history in America with slavery. And then we just do Corsair, like, oh, happy dancing slaves, like, no problem. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's it's, so it's true. Like, like, why are we doing that, guys? Like, think about it. We're Americans. We have to find another way to do this. It's our responsibility as Americans. That's incredible. And I, because I want to go back to your book in a second, but you do a lot of work with different ballet companies. Um, you recently just worked with Ballet West doing um, Shonda Rosling All because my boyfriend, Chris, was the emperor in that production. Um, talk a little bit about that because he was, you know, he said, I'm a white guy playing this emperor. And I, he was very nervous about it, but working with you, he felt so much better um, because you really helped them do it respectfully. Yeah, so, so the first half of my book is about Nutcracker, and it's a lot of history, and it talks about lots of different companies and how they've had this conversation. Um, again, final bow for yellow face in this movement. Um, Gina and I actually didn't start this. Um, you know, a man in, in Toronto named Ying Hope, who was a local council member, um, was talking to the National Ballet of Canada about this 40 years ago. Mm. Um, it just didn't become a, a global conversation until Gina and I were like, okay, how do we make this a bigger conversation. Um, so the first half of the book is about nutcracker stories and how we sort of consolidate all of these conversations that were already happening to kind of give everyone cover to make, to do better. The second half of the book is about um, Le Chante de Rossignol, which is this ballet from 1925. Uh, Balanchine made it for, it was his first commission for the Ballet Russe. Uh, it was his first collaboration with Stravinsky, which obviously led to like a lifelong partnership. Um, and it was sort of already had been sketched out. So Balanchine was sort of the second choice choreographer. So he kind of wasn't, it wasn't really his idea. He just was had, was paid to like sort of make something of the score and these costumes that were sort of halfway done and you know basically like figure it out. Um, and the original ballet was for the Ballet Russe. It premiered in 1925. Uh, it was, the sets and costumes were, were by uh, Henri Matisse. So they're these beautiful, chinoiserie costumes. Um, it was originally done in yellow face. You know, the dancers literally painted their face yellow, um, which you think at the time was just sort of like, well, if you don't have Asian dancers in the company and you want to take your audience to Asia, like that's the closest thing you can do, I guess, um, you know, to give that like a style. But then you look at all of the history of yellow face sets, you know, Mickey Rooney and Breakfast at Tiffany's, you know, to Long Duck Dong and, and, and the Breakfast Club, or, you know, 16 Candles, whatever, all, all of the, all of that Asian, um, Asian-ness. And within that context of where we're standing today, that yellow face is unacceptable. It's just like, you can't do it. Um, and that's our responsibility as white people for having fucked up. Like yeah. that's the, we now have to pay for like not respecting people correctly. So so we can't do blackface anymore. We can't do yellow face anymore. So how do you still look at this ballet? And there are merits to this ballet. It, it's, you see a lot of early Balanchine it, as sort of like the bridge between the sort of petty pas imperial style and his later neoclassical style. You see some of his, you know, playing with, with those ideas. Um, also the other problem with it is it's a reconstruction um, by, uh, uh, Millicent Hodges and, and Kenneth Archer, who are amazing dance scholars. They really d devoted their whole life to finding pieces of this ballet. This is literally like a culmination of a life's work for them. And their point of view was that like, it wasn't their responsibility to change it. They just had to recreate it from what they had. Um, unfortunately, there, there were pieces that were just missing because you know the ballet was incomplete. So for me, I was like, well, if you're willing to sort of make up or fudge things here, why are you not willing to fudge it just to make it so that the audience can actually appreciate and see past the uncomfortableness and see the patterns and see the design and see the choreography? Um, my biggest fear was that audiences would see this and just go, well, that's racist. This is, I'm so uncomfortable. I can't appreciate this. I can't say anything nice about this when there's so much there. Right. Um, so we were thinking of talking about like the setting for doing this and it was appearing on a Balanchine's Ballet Russe program, which was I believe two week weekends of shows. Um, so you couldn't in good faith do it in yellow face in that show and present it next to Prodigal and Apollo. It's like, oh, isn't this, isn't this fun? Yeah. Um, but if you were doing it in like a museum setting, say like the, you know, MoMA called us and said, hey, we're gonna do, um, we wanna do it as 
a reconstruction. We're going to have an Asian panel before and an Asian panel afterwards. It's literally a closed discussion. Uh, and we're, we're not going to shy away from talking about Yellowface. We're going to talk about that history. In that context, it's appropriate, but not on like a, and next we're doing Apollo. Like, <laughs> you know, like if you, can't, you can't present art as entertainment in that way. Absolutely. And it wasn't presented in that context. So we had to make some changes to what the original was in order to be acceptable for audiences today. And so in the book, I outlined best practices for any organization if they're doing work that has outdated representations of race, whether it's Porky and Bess or the Mikado or the King and I, Miss Saigon, you know, any works where there's an other race portrayed from a long time ago and times have changed, how do you deal with that? And, and so I, I really outlined tools for arts organizations moving forward to say, how do we not just say, well, the Mikado's racist, we can never do it again. Mm. Uh, to be honest, it's my favorite Gilbert and Sullivan musical. I will fight for the Mikado. I really love it, but you just can't do it in a racist way. You've got to figure out a different way to do it. And if you're a creative person, that's the challenge for us as creatives. It's like, okay, so like, this is racist. How do we find a non-racist way to do this and keep the parts about it that are worth keeping alive. Right, because we don't want to just start getting rid of shows or ballets, like let's not ever do Bayadere again or let's not ever do Corsair again. I mean, they're, like you said, I think the, the key is to find different ways because I think that's also not good just to, well, we're not going to just, we're just not going to do it. Um, also, as, an, as an Asian choreographer, you need to have those foundations if you're working in the ballet vocabulary to be able to have a departure point to make something new. If you don't understand Eddie Pa's structures and how he built the ballets and how he strung the steps together and how he made transition steps and how he responded to musicality, if you don't understand those things, you can't make new interesting movement or else it's just like jello. You know, it's not actually informed by anything. So if you really want to have that vocabulary, you need to preserve the past in order to move forward. So. There is a reason to preserve by Adair, but there is also an equal reason that we should be supporting more Asian choreographers in giving them chances to make work that just is, is just as loud as by Adair. You know what I mean? So it's sort of like both. We have to address both at the same time. And going back to your book, I started reading it last night and I think everybody needs to read it, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. But um, one of the things I love about you and what you do and how you've written it and when you speak out and do your work, you don't just point the finger and say, well, that's not right. You, you open the conversation. You're willing to say, hey, let's talk about it. Because I think a lot of us are just scared to even talk about it because again, we don't want to be offensive or we don't even want to go there. But you are very good about saying, here is what we need to do. Um, and you're very good about opening the dialogue, which I think is the start. So the, the subtitle of my book is Dancing Between Intention and Impact. And that's really how I think we have to frame the conversation in order for it to be productive and constructive. So if I said to you, Catherine, your new ballet is racist. Um, the, the new ballet you choreographed is racist. You would say, well, no, because I love Mexican food. I lived in Japan for three years and my cousin's black. So mm -hmm. yeah, and my boyfriend's Chinese. I can't be racist. Um, and then you immediately just shut down and dismiss anything else I have to say. You get defensive, you feel bad, you, and that doesn't make you feel like creatively finding a better solution. Whereas if I say to you, Catherine, you know your new ballet, um, I know you intended it for it to be funny, but the way it came off for me as an Asian person was like, like that I was the butt of the joke. Was that your intention of doing that way? And you'd say, oh, no, that's not, I mean, I, I, I'm not racist, my cousins, you know, black, I, I love Mexican food, whatever. And I had no, I just never even considered that, that that would be where it would land. And because I'm an artist with integrity and I want everyone to get the joke, I'm gonna have to figure out a new way to tell that joke so that everybody's laughing. And when you set up that kind of a framework for people mentally to have that conversation, when you set up the space that way, people are open-minded and open minds lead to creativity. So a perfect example of this, and you know, spoiler alert, um, I closed the, the Nutcracker chapter with a story about uh, Peter Bull at Pacific Northwest Ballet. Mm -hmm. I'll be one day, 
no, no promise, promise you won't laugh, but I have an idea like for Chinese. I just, can I run it by you? Like, yeah, sure, sure, no problem, Peter. He says, okay, so you know the, the variation, you know, two girls push out the box. It's sort of vaudeville, like what's in the box, what's in the box, sort of a game. And then out pops this Chinese man. Um, I thought, what if instead of a Chinese man, what if it was a Chinese cricket? And I said, Peter, that's brilliant. A Chinese cricket in Chinese culture is a symbol of luck, mm -hmm. spring, so, so sort of like Marie's journey into womanhood, like a cricket is a very appropriate symbol for a young woman. It's the most musical of animals in Chinese culture, just like a Balanchine dancer is the most musical of dancers. And it fits with the choreography. It's, it's all big jumps, like a cricket. And if you look at the girl's relationship, they're sort of like, they're coming towards him, but they're sort of scared of him. And it's like, it's their pet bug. You know, they love their pet bug. It's their pet, but it's also like a bug. So it's kind of, gross and scary and you know if you've seen a cricket jump around it's kind of like ah you know it's everywhere you know so it, it fits with the dance and I told Peter you can even put the fingers back because they kind of look like bug antennas you know like oh, make, it, make, it, make it something different and so I said if I were a young Chinese dancer in the audience and you gave me the choice between dancing the the chink in the box or the golden cricket like, which one do you think I would rather choose, which is respectful to my heritage? And it's the same Balanchine choreography. It's just changing the costume. Mm. And then, like the, the, but I'm, I'm not saying, well, there can't be any national dances or take out all of the flavor. I'm saying if you're going to do Chinese, do something that's respectful and fun from Chinese. If you're going to do Arabian, do something fun and respectful. Because if you think about it, Paddy Pa was a principal dancer in Spain in the king's court. He worked with Spanish dancers, so he knew Spanish dance. So this, even this movement, it's not in classical ballet. This is from Spanish dance that Petty Pa wove into his variations. Um, Russian dance, Ivanov, who choreographed Nutcracker and Swan Lake with Petty Pa, was Russian. A lot of the, the Cossack dance, the Gopak, so they were all incorporated into the folk dances, were all incorporated into Russian ballets, but like no Chinese dance, no Arabian dance. So when you compare the variations, you need to have a history of dance, understanding of dance history and political context in order to say, okay, well, yeah, what's the difference between Spanish and Chinese or Arabian and, and, and Russian? Why, why aren't they all the same? Because yeah. of that history. Yeah, that makes sense. Because I know Ballet West, you know, another example, they now have incorporated Chinese dragon into their- That's great, <laughs> you know? So, I, I mean, I'd much rather have that than, you know, bobbing and shuffling, you know? Right. Right. So along this theme, what can, you know, if, if a company is not doing this or even smaller regional companies, what can we all do to create this change? Like, what would you advise people to start doing in order to really make a positive impact? Again, instead of just pointing the finger. So or the fingers in this case. <laughs> yeah, or, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so one of the things I, a big conclusion I come to in the book is that the antidote to cultural appropriation um, is inclusion. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to pay homage to a culture, but you don't include us in the room, then you're basically just doing appropriation. Uh, there is a, you know, and I think that process that we do is like, if you want to do buy dare and you want to do it in an orientalist way, hire an Indian uh, choreographer to assist, hire an Indian costume designer, hire an Indian, you know, creative team to reimagine it and let them put their stamp on it. Um, if you want to do it in an Indian way and pay them, pay them like you would pay someone who's doing a set design for Swan Lake, um, that's inclusion. And so when you do that and, and you lean in, um, it, it doesn't feel like you're taking advantage of this other culture, um, especially if you look behind the scenes and if you're doing a good job and you have Indian board members and Indian students in your school and Indian faculty, um, you know, all of Indian administrators, all of those things, and then presenting an Oriental style ballet mm -hmm. probably is, is okay. There might be other room for Indian American choreographers who are making their own work alongside Bayadere. But that when you, when you don't have that uh, sense of equity across the field, um, it's really hard to do an Orientalist Bayadere with integrity, like when we don't even have Indian dancers in our companies. You yeah. know, like if, so we need to find new ways of doing that. So again, um, Doug Fong tonight, our buy a dare takes place in 1930s Hollywood. So it's like the golden age of, of you know, musicals. And so our, our Kingdom of the Shades is like a Busby Berkeley art deco fantasy. Oh, I love it. 
imagine it being in the rain, like Nakia is Debbie Reynolds, Solar is Gene Kelly and Lena Lamont, you know, I, I can't stand it. That's Gamzadi, you know, the sort of, and, and it's the same petty pas steps. Um, and if you if you go back to the petty pa, there's so much in there. Like uh, Doug was telling me about a feather dance in Corsair, where the slave girls dance with feathers. And I'm like, oh, it's like a Vegas burlesque routine. And he's like, absolutely, they're going to be showgirls in our production. And that's what petty pa was going for at the time. Was like, how do we have these like sexy showgirls, but like it's ballet, you know? So. But like that's it's that's what it is. So like let's just lean into that and make that what it is. So yeah. just finding new ways to interpret the old way of doing it that makes everybody inclusive. And it's not new either. Look at Creole Giselle with Dan Cedar Harlem. I mean, Arthur Mitchell was doing this already, you know, 40, 50 years ago with making those old world ballets, you know, new for us today. Right. And I know you have a pledge on your website for anybody to sign, but mostly I know a lot of company directors have signed it about working towards creating this change. Yeah, so if you go to yellowface.org, it started out as a pledge which basically says, I love ballet. It's affirming our shared love of ballet. And as part of that, I'm committed, you know, as part of my commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, I'm committed to eliminating outdated portrayals of Asians on our ballet stages. So it's just a commitment of doing better. It doesn't mean these companies are perfect. Uh, a lot of them are far from perfect but it means they're open to the conversation. So when, when people come to me and say, I have a problem with so-and-so's production of Nutcracker, I'm able to then say, if you send me an email, and this has happened with a few people, if you're able to send me an email with, with tell me what is the problem and then give me some constructive solutions on how that ballet company could improve, if you forward that email to me, I'll pass it along to the ballet company because they're, they're listening. Um, and so I've had this with a few other rep pieces besides Nutcracker, where people have said, this doesn't sit right with me. And it's a way for us to be a conduit to a conversation. Um, I will say this is, uh, this is sort of the price that Jean and I have had to pay to do this work. Um, instead of focusing our own careers, we're two people on a website. We're not a formal organization. We're doing this purely as volunteers, just as advocates. And I, both Jean and I do work on this every day, which takes away from our work as other practicing artists. So if you think about the price of racism, um, that's over the last three years, the hours I've spent working on Final Bout for Yellow Face when I could have been doing something else is the price that I have to pay for racism every day. Mm. And, how can, and how can people support you? How can, because this is, I think is an incredible thing and I, I would love to have people be able to support you. I think the biggest thing for us is if you see something in your community that isn't sitting right with you, speak up. You have more power than you think. I mean, Gene and I were two people on a website. Again, we're nobody, you know, and it's because we got a lot of other nobodies to come together and speak up together that we were able to achieve some change. So if you are at the Metropolitan Opera and you see Madame Butterfly and you're like, this makes me uncomfortable. You know, don't just expect someone else to do the work. Like you write that letter if it bothers you. Don't say, oh, well, I'm not Asian. It's not my problem. No, you're, you're a white person sitting in a, in a Eurocentric theater. It is your problem. Yeah. Um, so like, I think that's the first step. Um, I think, you know, write a check to your local dance organizations that are doing good diverse work. We are one of them, but there are lots of black organizations that are doing very critical work right now in terms of promoting equity. Um, you know, do your research, educate yourself, find resources uh, online. I think it's one great thing about social media is um, it has given us opportunities to have tools to educate ourselves. So find accounts that educate you, follow people who are having conversations that challenge you and that get you to ask questions. Um, and like you're doing, amplify voices that support, you know, other points of view that you think are relevant. So I think those are many ways that you can support. Um, buy my book, that helps. Um, but it, it really, uh, I was talking with Megan Fairchild at, at City Ballet and she was talking about how it was nice to have a book that you could sit and read at home, especially if you have a lot of your own questions. And I know that that is a privilege. As a person of color, no one ever gave me the luxury of having a safe space to learn about race. I learned it out in the world as a person. Um, 
but this book is a, a start for you, you know, if you want to be more comfortable having this conversation. Um, racism won't get fixed. It's sort of like you'll never be a perfect ballerina, but like you still have to do tandus every day to get towards it. And I think that's how we need to start thinking about racism is like, you will never be a perfect non-racist person. You will just be an anti-racist person because you're doing the work every day. So in the same way that doing a tandu, you get better at doing a tandu the more you do it. And you, it's a stronger muscle. It, it's the same thing about talking about race. So as you're saying that you may not feel comfortable talking about race or going there, the more you read, the more you educate yourself, the more you have conversations like this, um, the more comfortable you are uh, at, at doing this work. It's just like a tandu. It really is just like a tandu. Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, I hope you can think about it in that way, that like- that's a great it's analogy. Not a journey, it's literally like a process, an ongoing process. And so. just bef before we end, cause I wanna, we're gonna do a giveaway for your book, but um, you and Gina also have a little uh, YouTube series that you've done recently called What's the Tea, where you have interviewed um, Asian American dancers. Talk a little bit, a little bit about, blah, talk a little bit about that because I started watching some of those and those are very impactful with, yeah. with those interviews. It was great. We were, it was sort of, it started out as like, um, you know, I, I published my book and I was like, oh, Gina, like maybe, you know, maybe ZJ for maybe T, who's a good friend of ours, maybe she could interview me and like do it on an, a live stream. Maybe we'll do it up, you know, in, on May 1st for Asian Pacific Heritage Month. And then I was like, we were talking about, it, I was like, wait, this is like, why are we talking about me? We should be talking about her. Like she's doing much more interesting stuff. Uh, and then we were like, but it's more than ZJ too. Like, there's so many Asian dancers and it feels like because Asians have some success in the ballet world, our issues don't matter. Like we're at least in the room, if not fully at the table. So we should just keep our heads down and let's focus on, you know, other people of color's conversations and our racism is sort of, we can just ignore it. Mm -hmm. um, it's not to say that this other racism is not there, but it's to acknowledge that we still face challenges in the field even though the perception might be, oh, we have Asian principles everywhere, they're fine. You know, like you said, you couldn't name more than Ed Liang. So like, we do have work to do. Um, so uh, the What's the Tea series started because we thought, well, we know Asians, we know there's a lot of diversity within being Asian. How do we share all of those stories that might not get told? So we said, well, 31 days, 31 interviews, let's do an interview a day, right? No problem. <laughs> Everyone, everyone's available no one's doing anything it's just recording a, like an, a daily show whatever we just press record every day oh my goodness it was so much work <laughs> it's so much more like, for like what we do in terms of putting this together but we we basically um we wanted to show uh the diversity of being asian the breadth of experiences we wanted to call out some of the racism we experienced in the field but what emerged was this beautiful tapestry of experiences of people sharing, I've had that experience too, or I felt this way too, or I thought I was the only one. And so it was our hope that by showing that Asians can be from Shanghai, they can also be third generation Asian American, they can be biracial, a quarter Asian and still be Asian. And all of those experiences inform how we make our way through this dance world when we are not in the majority and what does that feel like and what does that look like um daniel applebaum from city ballet wrote a really lovely piece in point magazine i highly recommend everyone check that out he's a beautiful writer um just sharing his own experiences of confronting his own racism that he felt and his own barriers that he put on his asianness to try and pass as white mm -hmm. um, in so being able to talk about those things a little bit more can also help us undo the larger systemic issues of racism. Again, complementing black and brown stories all together um, can really help us move the spotlight away from saying ballet is just for and by white people to saying ballet is for everybody and for everybody. And if ballet needs to survive in the 21st century in diverse America, it really does have to shift really in a big way not just like to how we tell stories, but who gets to tell stories, who's supporting the stories, who's paying for the stories, who's buying a ticket to the stories, who's reviewing the stories, who's funding the stories, you know, all of that. It's like, we have to examine all of that. 
It's so true. Um, and I will link that YouTube series. I will link your book, but we are going to be doing a giveaway. Phil has suggested that. I think it's amazing. Um, so one, are you good with this? One viewer will will receive a copy of your book. All you guys have to do is just leave us a comment in the box below um, about your point of view on this, about what you can do, um, and we will pick a winner at random. Um, and Phil has generously agreed to give away a copy of the book. So I think that's... I think I can choose a winner based on somebody who can articulate um, articulate the, this message in a constructive way. Absolutely. And, um, doesn't get people riled up and defensive in a way that's really open and vulnerable. So if you can share your experience, regardless of your race, this is not just for an Asian person, but talk about race and ballet. If you can articulate that well, I'm happy to share my book with you. Um, also letting you know that if you'd like a signed copy of my book, um, I'm doing a little bit of a fundraiser for the Museum of Chinese in America. It's a small museum in Chinatown that means a lot to me. They're really wonderful and they're um, they actually had a big fire in their archives right before COVID hit, so they lost a lot of their um, sort of, you know, priceless materials that tell Asian American stories. So um, if you join at $125, which is their family level, you get all of the benefits to the museum um, in New York, but you also join the, the North American uh, reciprocal membership. So even if you're in Miami or you're in Utah, um, you probably get access to the local museums for free through this membership. Um, and so if you are doing some local traveling, you know, around, if you want to support even um, local museums, this is a great way to, to stay involved um, and help support uh, Chinese American history. So um, just, just go to the Museum of Chinese America in New York, uh, join the membership level and uh, send either Catherine or myself an email and we'll make sure you get a signed copy of the book. Yeah, I will put all of that info in the box below to make it easy for everybody. Um, Phil, thank you so much. This was amazing. So, thank you, Catherine. Please I, give her a big hug, my my Chinese emperor. Yeah, I will. He said to tell you hi, so he's like, please tell him I said hi. So I will, and um, I will continue to use this platform to you know promote this and to be a supporter of of change because I think it's so important. So. Um, good up, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you so much. You have a good day. Bye.